Did you, did you have a follow-up on that? Yeah. And what is the signature? How do you find, is it, do you go by the address, or how do you find, you know, whose signature that is, if, if the signature is really? The, the question is, how do you find that, that individual with the signature, <clears throat> if you can't read the signature? Can you do it by address? And the answer is yes. Okay. That's how they do it. They go in, they type an address that appears on the petition, they'll look for all the registered voters that are registered to vote at that particular address. Okay. And they'll look for a signature that matches. Okay? okay. Yes, sir? Yeah, from the okay. Um, the question was, if you've got multiple, a, a person signing multiple petitions, can you get an affidavit from that person uh, stating when he or she signed the petition? Um, and as far as the affidavit, that is one way to do it. That is a possible way for you to bring in evidence. Um, the other side might object to that, that affidavit, um, on the grounds that it's hearsay. But again, as I say, we have a more relaxed view of the hearsay standard than, uh, than the circuit court would, would um, allow. So you know, yes, we do allow affidavits. Um, of course, the best way to do it is bring the person in to testify. Um, but we do allow affidavits if they're in proper form. All right, let's move on. Um, records examination. If part of the objections has to do with the validity of individ individual signatures, uh, those are going to be resolved initially through a records examination. And what happens is, the hearing officer will schedule a hearing, or I'm sorry, a records examination sometimes on the, at the initial date, at the initial hearing or management conference. They will say, we have a slot for you uh, on December 8th at 10, I'm sorry, 9 a.m., show up on the sixth floor at the Board of Election Commissioners, and we're going to conduct a records examination. Um, the purpose of this is to go through the board's voter registration database. And this is all computerized. Um, the, all the paper records were digitized and computerized in the uh, late 1990s. And so it's all electronic. And if you've ever been up in the sixth floor, uh, you can see multiple computer screens up there. You can call up um, an, an individual's voter registration record uh, by name or by address. And so they will schedule this records examination and they will tell you uh, how many teams there will be, how many stations there will be. Uh, if it's a small records examination, they may assign it just to one station. If it's a large records examination, if we're dealing with a large number of challenge signatures, um, they could do you know, half dozen, a dozen maybe even more stations. Uh, at one point uh, or another, we've had as many as 100 stations going at the same time. And you know they spread them out on the sixth floor. We've got them on the eighth floor. We've got them down here. Anywhere we can find a computer and find space, we'll do a records examination. But they will tell you at the beginning how many stations you're going to have, because then it's up to you to find out or find enough people to cover that records examination. And then on the date and time, you must show up. As in every other proceeding, you have to show up. Now, generally, we talked about sample examinations, where if you have a preliminary motion objecting to an objector's petition because it's not brought in good faith, it's a shotgun objection, they can do a sample objection. And they'll figure out some formula, some statistical formula for selecting how many signatures they want to look at. And so they will do it on a sample basis and then report back to the hearing officer. Also, there may come a point during a record examination where the result is pretty obvious. And they may get halfway through and you know, the supervisor of the voter registration department is going to say, even if you sustained all the remaining objections on these other sheets, if you say every one of those objections, a good objection, should be sustained, 
the candidate is still going to have enough good signatures, good and valid signatures. And there's just no point in continuing this pain. So they will suspend the records examination and send the results to the hearing officer. If the hearing officer so desires, he can say, no, I want this to go forward. Please go back and complete a full records examination on that issue. Uh, that doesn't happen very often. Usually when, when the supervisor up there makes a, a judgment that um, this is just a uh, foregone conclusion and an exercise in futility, he's generally right because he's had uh, a lot of experience in that. So it may be possible that that records examination is going to get cut short. Okay, these are the four issues that can be decided during the course of <clears throat> a record examination. First, whether a signer of a petition sheet is a registered voter. Um, if we can't find that individual, you know, registered at all, um, then the presumption is the person is not registered. If he's not in our system, the presumption is he's not registered. So that's, that objection will be sustained. Um, be mindful, however, that if we find a registration record and their status is listed as inactive, and we have two categories, we have active and inactive. Uh, inactive um, is, is a status that we assign to people where we've done a canvas and there's some question of whether or not the voter is still residing at that address because we've gotten return mail saying that it's undeliverable at that address. We are required to list that person as inactive and to carry him as inactive for a period of two federal general elections. And if they don't vote during that period or if they take no action to restore the validity of their, their uh, registration, then we cancel the registration. But while they're inactive, that means that they can still sign a petition. Just because they're inactive doesn't mean they're not eligible to sign a petition. So if the objection is that he's not a registered voter and we find the registration and the registration shows that the voter is, in fact, inactive, that registration, I'm sorry, that objection will be overruled. The second issue is whether the signature of a petition sheet is, is genuine. <clears throat> and we talked a little bit about uh, how we go about uh, making a determination whether the signature is genuine. The one uh, additional uh, in information I would like to add on that is that if the board clerk makes a determination that the signature is not genuine, they will record that. And if a party, and usually in that case it will be the candidate, appeals the decision of the clerk, the, the, that signature will be reviewed by the board's forensic handwriting expert. The Board of Election Commissioners retains a forensic handwriting expert. We're the only electoral board jurisdiction in the state that does that. So we have someone, we have a handwriting expert on staff that will examine that signature and make a decision. And then they can either uphold the call of the board clerk or reverse it. And then, of course, the parties can appeal that decision if they so wish. But there is that other check built into the system for uh, signature genuineness. Um, if no registration record is found, our practice is we're going to overrule the objection. Because we're going to say, well, we can't look at it. We can't make a determination whether the signature on the petition is genuine because we have nothing against which to match it. So we will overrule the objection. It's still possible the objector has information on, of his own that will support his argument that the, object, that the signature is not genuine. You know, they may have other documents signed by that individual um, that they feel proves that the signature is not genuine. 
but it's going to be the objector's burden at that, por uh, at that point to come forward during an evidentiary hearing and bring that kind of evidence in. At the record of the examination, however, that objection will be overruled. The third category is uh, whether the signer of the petition sheet is registered at the address shown next to the petition. They have to sign their signature. They have to put their address. They have to be registered at that address. That individual may be a registered voter, but if they're registered somewhere else, that signature is gone. They may have forgotten to change their registration. And that's unfortunate. And hopefully they'll change their registration before election day. But the requirement is that the, even at the bottom of the circulator's affidavit, the circulator's attesting that these people were registered at that address at the time they signed the petition. It's no help that the voter goes out and changes his registration after they sign the petition. That's not going to restore that signature. Fourth category is whether the signer of the petition is a resident of the political subdivision ward or district involved. In the city of Chicago, for citywide candidates, they have to be registered in the city of Chicago. For an aldermanic candidate, a signer of a petition has to be registered to vote in that ward. If they're registered to vote in the next ward, doesn't do your candidate any good. They have to be registered to vote in the ward in which the candidate is seeking election. 